What are we doing? Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our oh, podcast, podcast listeners. Podcast listeners. Yes. We love our podcast listeners. You know, it was like about a month ago, um, we asked them, our listeners, uh, about uh, possible sponsorship for right. the show. And that's really an unanswered question. But within a couple of days, we had literally hundreds of, of responses. We were inundated with good suggestions. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, from all standpoints. And anyway, that's a subject to be continued. Today, um, now we recorded this a little out of sequence because of schedules of yours and schedules of Lindsay's, but we came to part two of the 10 most important historical events. And it was just a great conversation, kind of open ended. Um, it went to places I didn't anticipate. Uh, I really enjoyed it very, very much. Ditto. You know, we, each of us made a list of 10 pivotal moments. Uh, this was from a question by Bridget from, I think, Iowa. Um, and so we got to 20, and then we each had extras. So it wound up being around 30 uh, total. And, of course, we're if you, if you went to professional university historians and said, these two knuckleheads are going to do this. They'd say, can't be done. It, it, it's a silly enterprise. That, that's reductionist, et cetera. But I don't think that's true at all. But it was fascinating. And we, you know, we talked about how historians think, how she thinks, and you know, how, how we need to be really cautious about commenting on events of our own time because they haven't settled out yet. We don't know what historical weight they will have. You came at it as a humanities scholar, and she came at it as a historian. For better or worse, my own training is a mile wide, let's say, and an inch deep. And she's much more of an American historian of the early national period. And so those two really contrasting styles. And I think it actually works for the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Um, I, 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 would be, I think it would be a less interesting program if we were two historians of the early national period. I, I don't know if the word contrasting styles, if I'd stand for that, because... You know, it's more a case of you bring, each of you bring out more areas that in the other. Um, you know, the questions that you ask her and how she responds, I, I think you bring the best of both of you out. Well, I appreciate that. You know, she's really fun to be around because she uh, takes no prisoners. And so it allows me to sort of do a reality check. What's the best thinking on certain things in this moment, things that I might have first learned in 1980 or 1990 or 1999. And so it's really a great reality check for me. And each week I come away with a slightly more nuanced view of American history, thanks to this brilliant young woman who, for whatever reason, is giving us a fair amount of her professional time. So I do thank Bridget very much. I hope Bridget um, finds this all useful. In her letter, her email, her original email, she said that she walked a thousand miles right. during the pandemic listening to the Thomas Jefferson hour. I mean, geez, that's pretty, am <laughs> that, that kind of made me sit back and go, whoa, <laughs> I better be careful how I talk. <laughs> Dream higher here. But I, yeah. I do feel, uh, I feel a little bit of uh, guilt here, David, because uh -oh. uh, Bridget is a high school teacher. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things that we're talking about here are not beyond the intelligence of high school students, but they're beyond the scope of a high school curriculum. So, you know, high school is a is a bare bones approach to history. You, right. know, you talk about the causes of the of the First World War. You talk about the uh, uh, casualties of the Civil War. You you talk about the American Revolution. You talk about the War of eighteen twelve. You, you talk about the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil Rights Movement, and so on. There are these markers that you have to hit, and it doesn't allow for a lot of um, nuance nuance, or the things that seem less significant, but actually, as Lindsay says, are in many respects more significant than the, the banner headline events. As a listener, what I get is it's, it's not so much what happened as why it happened and the players behind the scene that actually made it happen. And you guys both got into that this week. Um, the stuff about John Quincy Adams was priceless. Yeah. Well, th take, take an example. When I put together my list, I would not do this without talking about Native Americans. I, I just am wired now, in some part thanks to you, never to not 
think about Native Americans in any historical thing that I'm doing. It's central to my consciousness as it is to yours. If we were doing this list for Bridget, we and it was about American history, we would start with the Revolution and, and of course, Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, and then we would have to move into enslaved people and the rights of Native Americans. And you know, when I thought about it, I went, oh my God, I'm so glad I don't have to make a list of 10 because it would be so difficult. But when I think about what Bridget was probably looking for, I think that was probably more of a list. But it's so easy to to stereotype. You know, in the program, you talked about uh, Frederick Douglass and his mm. narrative. You got to read his narrative. You, you know, everybody has a stereotype of of who he was and what a great man he was, but it's that nuance that makes it valuable and makes it memorable and affects people's thinking and their decisions. And I'll stop there. No, and let me just tell a very quick story about that that we didn't have time for. So Frederick Douglass became a friend of Abraham Lincoln, uh, which is in itself a really interesting fact. Um, and he went to an event in Washington, D.C. at the White House. And Lincoln was inside. It was a reception. There were hundreds of people there, all of them white, of course. And Frederick Douglass came up to the gate or to the door and announced himself. And the guards turned him away and said, sorry, uh, this is not your, no, sorry. I mean, no Africans are are welcome here. Douglas wrote a note and said, take this to the president. They did. When Lincoln saw it, he immediately instructed his guards to bring Frederick Douglas into the reception. And when Douglas came in, Lincoln said over the heads of all this crowd of white people said, Mr. Douglas, I'm so glad you're here. I'm, I'm particularly interested in seeing you today. Come forward and shake my hand. Isn't that a great story? It is. It is. You know, it, it's so great to hear the two of you in the form that you did today. And I just have to say uh, thanks again to all the listeners who responded to our call for their opinions on the show. And remind folks that if you want to correspond with the Jefferson Hour, it's very simple. Go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Ask President Jefferson, and, and you can email us directly. And I promise you, I read every email that comes in. So I've been busy reading a lot of emails lately. And also, and I got to do the pitch, if you would like to support the show, there's an easy way to do that on the website. Just click on Donate, and you can see some of the options. And we really appreciate that so very much. Also, lastly, and I'll let you take us out, Clay, Clay has so many things going on, cultural tours and classes online, and um, you can find out about all that at jeffersonhour.com. Indeed, you can. And, and the Greek trip, for example, still has a few places in it. I'm so excited to be taking a group next September, I think on the 15th, to Greece, uh, to Homeric Greece. This is going to be one of the great journeys of my life. My daughter, Catherine, is joining as a co-host on that. She's a classicist from Columbia University in New York, now at Oxford. Um, and also there are online courses coming, including one on the Mort d'Arthur, the great Arthurian saga from first published in 1485 in Middle English, uh, but also used by Mark Twain and John Steinbeck uh, and others. Um, and so that'll be a course that's coming. Uh, also a course on, on the 10 most iconic photographs. You can see how my mind is into these 10 things. Uh, but the 10 most iconic photographs of the 20th century, and so on. So everyone can go to jeffersonhour.com to find out more about that. And, you know, just as we close and go to the show, which I think is one of the best shows we've done, I want to say this about the ranch. You know, you said last week someone wrote in and said, don't ask for a ranch, they go bankrupt. I'll make it cash flow. I'll make that <laughs> ranch cash flow. So don't don't be put off. Uh, this is your time. It's, you know, tax season. It's tax season. Unload well, that not, thing. Not by the time they hear this show. We're recording it, like I said, the week before Christmas, but this will not broadcast till the middle of January, so you're out of luck on that one. Or even an electric bike. Just send the electric bike. You know, I, I'll take, God bless us, everyone. Let's go to the show. <laughs>
Good day, citizens, and welcome to this week's edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We are so pleased to be joined again by Lindsay Chervinsky and Clay Jenkinson, and she had a conversation last week that we really didn't get a chance to finish. It came from a question from Bridget Brandt in Grinnell, Iowa. She's a middle school teacher, I believe, and she wanted to know what the 10 most important historical events, people, or places are that all people should know. Now, the two of you provided me with lists of your 10 most important. I thought it was really interesting that Clay kind of came at it more from a humanity standpoint, and you, Lindsay, came at it from more of a historian standpoint. I wonder, would it be worthwhile to go through your list of 10 without getting too lost in it. I think we should just so that our audience knows what we chose and we won't be able to talk about all of this, but also, you know, we're interested in the, um, the nominations that didn't quite make the final list, the honorable mentions and so on. So, uh, Lindsay, quickly give us your 10. So I had the, uh, great treaty of 1722. I had the Constitutional Convention, in particular George Washington's letter to Benjamin Harrison as he was leaving the convention. I had the Monroe Doctrine, the Colfax Riots, the Panama Canal, the Civil Rights Movement, in particular the March um, on Selma. I had the Fall of the Berlin Wall, September 11th and January 6th. And I also did had the Civil War, and I had in particular the Reconstruction and the 14th Amendment. And what about your list, Clay? Number one, Neil Armstrong on the moon, July 21st, 1969. And by the way, these are in no particular order of priority. Uh, Number two, the coming of the internet uh, around 1995 to the American public. Number three, uh, duh, July 4th, 1776, the most pivotal day in the history of liberty. Number four, Richard Nixon voluntarily turning over the tapes, including the smoking gun tape on August 5th, 1974, thus shoring up constitutional norms. Number five, the New York Times winning the Pentagon Papers lawsuit at the Supreme Court on June 30th, 1971. Number six, a a kind of a double sadness, Plessy versus Ferguson, May 18th, 1896, in which the Supreme Court said separate but equal was good enough in America. And earlier, the Dred Scott decision of 1857 that said that black people had no rights, which the Constitution of the United States was bound to respect. Then number seven, August 9th, 1945, the second of the two atomic blasts in Japan, uh, Nagasaki. Number eight, the Battle of New Orleans, January 8th, 1815. Number nine, June 13th, 1979, when the U.S. Court of Claims sided with the Lakota and Cheyenne American Indians about the ownership of the Black Hills. And finally, number 10, in 1960, the Food and Drug Administration approves birth control pills for wide distribution in the United States. I think at the end of the conversation, I tried to interject. I was wishing we had a scientist to join the conversation with a list of 10 because you missed some some scientific things that I thought were real important. I, I, I recall talking about the Wright brothers and the invention of flight and the internal combustion engine and oil. Or penicillin. Well, and that gets into your honorable mentions. And I, I hate to bring it up, but at the end of the show, you... Uh, you talked about the invention of the Ziploc bag. Do you want to retract that or stand up for it? No, I regard the Ziploc bag as being as important as the invention of fire. But leaving <laughs> that aside, uh, of course we have our personal favorites. Um, I included the Ginsu knife, too, and the Vegematic. And I was really sorry that the two of you did not affirm those choices. Do you do you own any of these products? Oh, yes. I have many sets of Ginsu knives. In fact, I just not to get lost here, but I have a Ginsu knife that I purchased in 1975 and strangely enough it is the sharpest knife and i have hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of really fine knives never superior to the simple ginsu knife uh, you know there's sort of a lost look on Lindsay's face I, this it's was like what did she get herself her, into here you know for her time yeah well, so you, I'd, but also be she's too smart for this sort of nonsense <laughs> i came at i know we're going to talk about our methodology but i was thinking about like pivotal turning points in american history and i wasn't sure where the ginsu knife ranked as a turning point in the development of our society you don't have one do you no i don't but like but okay but see here's the thing how does how does a sharper blade change humanity have you ever tried to 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 
uh, cut your way through a chassis of a car and then make a BLT? Yeah, every other Tuesday, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, see, there you go. I hear many clicking noises of people. <laughs> yeah, people are moving for other okay, podcasts. We'll focus. You know? um, we'll focus. Right, there were some serious ones on your list, but I think it's fair to uh, to go to Lindsay with with any ones that she missed. So you mean some uh, responsible? Lindsay, yeah. Uh, so I had a bunch. I mean, I I wanted the way I approached it was mm-hmm. I was trying to you know cover sort of the swath of. United States history and American history. So I wanted to make sure I had founding moments and sort of each what I see as huge turning points. But there were a lot to choose from from all of those things. So, you know, like I I obviously had considered the importance of July 4th. I thought that was a little bit too on the nose for this particular program. Um, So I selected not to include that one. Um, I had the farewell address, of course, because I think that is essential to the foundations of our democracy. Then when I was thinking about the Civil War, I think there are so many that really could be selected. I had considered Fort Sumter, which I see sort of as the real beginning of the war and and at the moment when there is no longer a union, but rather uh, this confederacy trying to force its way into a separate nation. I think the Emancipation Proclamation probably has to be at least on a B-list somewhere. Um, and then, you know, for the 20th century, things, of course, like, you know, we talked about the internet last time, and I think electricity and the importance of all these things, I would say air conditioning <laughs> is probably up there. Um, very grateful for that, given that I live in Washington, D.C. But the other three that I had thought of, other four I had thought of, were the Roaring Twenties. World War II needed something, so maybe D-Day, maybe we select that. That's kind of a whole pivotal moment we kind of left out. And then, you know, we had talked about with the Pentagon Papers, the moment that I think of with Vietnam as a turning point is the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So those were the ones that I had sort of had on my list where uh, I think they that everything afterwards was different than everything that came before. If I could bring it up, and that would be the assassination of John F. Kennedy. To me, that marks 60 years of the distrust in government that uh, then was really reinforced by one of your points, Clay, and that was the Watergate incident. That really marked the point where people began to say, you know, I'm not so sure we need to be trusting our federal government. Well, particularly after the Warren report in September of 1964, which was almost immediately treated by the American public with scorn and deep skepticism. But I have some questions for Lindsay about her list But before that, I want to just point to another assassination. The assassination of John Kennedy was, of course, um, a catastrophic event. I remember where I was that day. Everyone who was alive that day uh, remembers where they were. But I think the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was a much more important event, and I think Lindsay will agree, because the last chance we had for some sort of real reconciliation after the war died Uh, at Ford's Theater or in the house across the street the following morning. Lincoln was uh, a a deeply humane man. Just read his second inaugural address uh, with malice towards none and charity to all. If he had lived, I think that Reconstruction would have been different. I think that the North and South might have found ways to heal the breach more quickly. I think that the loss of Lincoln, like the loss of FDR, like the loss of John Kennedy, like the loss of William McKinley, leads to a new president who overreacts in some important ways to what they saw as the legacy of their predecessor. Uh, what say you, Lindsay? I agree with that. I mean, I think there are, I, I do think there actually were moments where reconstruction, if not reconciliation, were possible afterwards. I think that had Grant kept up his attempts to support and defend civil rights uh, for recently enfranchised African-Americans. I think it's even possible that if Garfield hadn't died, he might have been able to do more because he was, I think, a deeply decent human. Um, But there's no doubt that going from Lincoln to Johnson is a particularly (laughs) enormous step down. Whereas when Kennedy died, you know, Johnson, of course, ended up, I think, making some mistakes with Vietnam, but he was an intensely competent political leader and really was able to harness all of his political power to ensure the passage of essential civil rights legislation. So while things ended up not going so well with Vietnam, he was, I don't think, maybe maybe not as charismatic, but he was not the sort of step down from Lincoln to Johnson. 
that we saw. And Theodore Roosevelt, of course, stepped up to the challenge of the presidency. He was was very excited to have the challenge of the presidency after McKinley. Um, bless him. And so, you know, I do think that that is a, a remarkably pivotal moment in the 19th century and, and therefore an extra tragic one because it's not just the death of Lincoln, but rather the death of so much possibility. I agree 100 percent. I also agree with your assessment of, of the Kennedy-Johnson uh, interface. You know, Kennedy probably couldn't have gotten the civil rights legislation of 1964 and 1965 passed. That was Lyndon Johnson, who partly banking on the 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 martyrdom of Kennedy, so the national desire to, to do what Jack wanted, but also uh, Lyndon Johnson's amazing political capacity to twist arms and buttonhole people and to do the kind of serious horse trading that, that political uh, achievement requires. So I think it cuts both ways with Lyndon Johnson. I think he overreacted to what he thought was Kennedy's commitment to Vietnam, and that became a national tragedy. Uh, I have a question for you. So, Lindsay, this thing happened to me right after our last meeting. You mentioned the Colfax massacre. If I knew about that, I didn't remember it. But like two days later, I saw it in a couple of different places. It's like a new vocabulary where does this happen to you when, when something swims into your historical consciousness, then you begin to see it in unexpected places? It happens all the time. It's funny. I don't know if it's just how your brain works, where all of a sudden you're aware of something or... The universe has a wicked sense of humor or whatever it is, but it is ironic how often I will learn about something and then all of a sudden I will see it everywhere. And is your response like mine? It's kind of interested, even fascinated, but slightly ashamed too. That means that I've been missing it. Unless there's some sort of providential serendipity going on here, it means that I've been blind to it until this moment. Yeah, I think it's definitely interesting. I I always have that sense too, but I think it's also a really good reminder that history should never be something that we stop doing because as professionals, we are continuing to learn and take in new information. And so we cannot expect students to have all of the answers. We cannot expect teachers to have all the answers. And we as American citizens should continue to try and embrace learning more so that we continue to have those moments of revelation. Interesting. We need to take a short break from the conversation, but we will return In just a moment, you're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, a continuation of the 10 most important historical events with Lindsay Chervinsky and Clay Jenkinson. When we took our break, we were talking about things popping up and then you noticing them. And that gave me the idea this was a perfect segue into noticing some of your work, Lindsay. Um, You have a blog, and we haven't talked about that in a long time. And tell people what it is and and how they can sign up to receive it. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Um, It is a newsletter. It is on Substack. It is free. Um, If you want to subscribe and get it into your inbox, that would be great. But you can read it online if that's your preference. If you go to lindsaytravinsky.substack.com, you can sign up. It's also called Imperfect Union, which is on point with many of the themes that we have talked about regularly. Or you can just go to my website and there's a a link to sign up there as well. And I send out one email a month, never spam. It's always on the 15th. So there's one going out. We're recording this in December. There's one going out tomorrow morning. And um, usually I include an essay as well as links and everything to events and other things that I've written or podcasts like this one. And so it's a good way to stay on top of kind of everything. And I'm a subscriber and I always look forward to it. And a note to our webmaster when the program is aired that maybe we can put a link up so people can easily find that. Of course. And, and Clay, I know you had a couple more questions from the last segment. I'll hand it off to you. I do. And so I was really impressed, of course, with Lindsay's list, but I have a couple of questions. One is a, is a relatively simple one. On your secondary list, you mentioned the farewell address of George Washington. Here's what I understand about that. Madison took the first shot at it. Uh, when he and Washington were still pretty close, uh, Washington then held it back because he wasn't, it turns out, quite ready to retire. Madison and, and Washington start to drift apart. Uh, Madison is, is leaning towards Jefferson, and, uh, Matt, and George Washington is pretty disillusioned with both of them, particularly Jefferson. So when he finally gets around to doing it in a big way, he turns to none other than Colonel Alexander Hamilton, And Hamilton provided much of the actual language that we see uh, 
uh, in the farewell address. I'm not saying that, that it's not Washington's thoughts, but it clearly is Hamilton's prose. Is that correct? It is, although I would add a couple of important notes. So it is an incredibly prescient, incredibly wise document, but it's also incredibly political. So he was concerned that it would be met with criticism by the emerging Jeffersonian Republicans because they pretty much criticized everything he did. And so he, when he was talking with Hamilton about this project, he had a couple of requests. He, he had a list of topics he wanted to discuss, and he wanted Hamilton to address them. But he also sent Hamilton a copy of Madison's first draft. And he instructed Hamilton to include a segment from the very beginning, word for word, so that when it was publicized, it was really a shot across the bow. And it was a warning to them to stay silent because- Like, remember they... who you once were, Mr. Madison? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It was a, And it was, it was a warning to them to stay silent, a warning to them that he still had that language, a warning to them that he would be very happy to show it. And it worked. They were pretty quiet about the subject. And then when Hamilton sent the draft back, Washington did make a few adjustments at the end. So I agree that it is definitely Hamilton's wordsmithing, but it is very much Washington's sort of brainchild. Of course, and I would never attempt to undermine that, but it is true, and you tell me if I'm wrong, I think it's true that Washington was always a little insecure about his own capacity as a writer and that it's hard for us to accept that because he actually turns out to be a very good writer, but that he was self-conscious about it, particularly in turning his gaze towards Jefferson, this master creator of prose. And so he often turned to others to help shape some of his more important pronouncements. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. He was very aware that he didn't have the sort of formal education that Jefferson and Madison had, and to a certain extent Hamilton as well. And so he was eager to often receive their assistance. And he that didn't and I think what's really interesting is it's such a a team process because he always had edits and he always had input on what he wanted said, um, but was more than happy to take their beautiful creations whenever it worked for him. Much like a modern president who has speechwriters and five or six different people send in drafts. And they are, you know, synthesized and decisions get made and the president himself makes adjustments even at the last minute. In a sense, Washington was anticipating a, a now well-worn habit in presidential pronouncements. Okay, so I want to turn to a, a maybe slightly more contentious uh, question for you. Uh, you said that the uh, Monroe Doctrine was Monroe's pronouncement, but it really belongs to John Quincy Adams. And I will grant you that John Quincy Adams may have been the most talented Secretary of State in American history. I'm a big fan of his work. But I have in front of me a letter from Mr. Thomas Jefferson to Monroe. I'm sure you know it and just have suppressed it. That <laughs> Jefferson was asked by Monroe, I'm thinking about some sort of a new policy with respect to the hemispheres what my gifted sage of Monticello might you think? And Jefferson wrote a letter saying, here's the deal. If they leave the Western Hemisphere entirely alone and never interfere here, we will provide a tremendous quid pro quo and never interfere in events on the other side of the Atlantic. So don't you want to give Mr. Jefferson some credit for the Monroe Doctrine? He was, after all, the the mentor of his protege, Monroe, whereas John Quincy Adams was a quasi-federalist from another state. Do you know what prompted Monroe to send that letter? <laughs> no, do tell us. <laughs> they had a cabinet meeting earlier that week where John Quincy Adams proposes the idea, and Monroe writes to Jefferson asking him if he thinks it's a good idea. That's a great clarification. So in other words, and I'm not disputing with you, I'm just playing with you, but you're saying it's J.Q. Adams, Monroe takes it under advisement, but does a reality check with Jefferson back at Monticello. <laughs> Jefferson affirms it, of course, provides magnificent language for it, as Jefferson would, but it really belongs more to John Quincy Adams than to the sage of Monticello. Kind of sounded like a dispute to me, didn't it, Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, you know, and I think that... Um, I think that Jefferson's encouragement was important for Monroe to sign on because he, of course, had such admiration. And he was insecure, for his too. Mentor. And he was. He had good reason to be, um, if I may be so bold. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry. You know, um, you live in Virginia. 
You do live in Virginia. I like a lot of the Virginians. Um, it just he he's just so low on the Virginian list. Sorry. Anyway, I, I digress. Um, but I think the piece also that most people miss with the Monroe Doctrine is the public pronouncement was quite essential, and that was what was in the president's address, of course. But what had prompted this was a conversation that JQA had had with the British minister at the time. And the British minister was saying, well, like, why don't we partner up to do this? And so the piece of it that is often forgotten is that John Quincy Adams also then had to reply in writing to the British minister. And that letter is a very forceful enunciation of the Monroe Doctrine as well. And what really, I think, put in place the diplomatic niceties because they cared, of course, much more about the dipl- the British and, and the European powers cared much more about the diplomatic correspondence than they did the president's address at the time. I have great sympathy for John Quincy Adams. Um, he wanted to be a poet. His parents said, oh, no, you have a, you have a glorious destiny, and it's not in belle lettres. And he wanted to marry a woman, and his mother vetoed it. And his mother was not particularly kind to Louisa, the woman that he eventually married. Fortunately, John Adams took a shine to her and protected her from the wrath the, I would say, Freudian wrath of Abigail Adams. But you may or may not know, Lindsay, that John Quincy Adams is a kind of hero in North Dakota because he gave us at least uh, half of North Dakota. The boundary under the Louisiana Treaty was going to be the watershed of the Missouri. John Quincy Adams was the senator at the time from Massachusetts. He held up the treaty in the Senate, said, no, we're not going to settle the northern boundary till we know more. And when he was Secretary of State, he came into an agreement with the British to established the border at the 49th parallel, thus giving North Dakota the Cheyenne River Valley, the Suris River Valley, and the Red River Valley about half of the state. Otherwise, we would be this shrunken thing along the Missouri. So once again, his his, his brilliance is uncontestable. Yeah, I mean, he was so smart that he just, I think really his brilliance is what undid him as president because being a good president requires working with other people. (laughs) He was just too smart sometimes to do that. So I have, you know, that's a pretty, that's a unique problem to have that you're so smart that everyone else just annoys you. So, um, that's how I I, feel around you. you, you, You're always just annoyed, you know, just, Oh yes. (laughs) No, I wouldn't keep showing up if I was always annoyed. Um, Well, maybe you would. (laughs) Uh, so I just think that he is, he is a particularly interesting and unique character in American history. And I'm always happy when he gets his due because, He really kind of was for a while there, like the Forrest Gump of American history. Possibly lost in all of the snark between the two of you are some very interesting insights. Uh, I thank you for that. I have another question for you uh, now that we're at it. Uh, Number 10 on your list, January 6th. But here's my question. You know, they say that newspaper people are the first draft of history, and then it takes time to shake all this down for historians finally to determine the weight and significance of any single thing. Um, So we're a bit out on a limb on some of this because, you know, 150 years from now, I'm not sure what January 6th will signify. Tell us how a historian works. How does a historian take contemporary newspapers and diaries and and position papers and speeches on the floor of Congress and sermons and everything else and assign, in retrospect, the proper weight to things that are passing in a very urgent way at the moment? When I'm looking at an event in the past, I want to both look at what happens before and after. So I look at the correspondence of the participants, whether that's, you know, for most of my work, that's actual written correspondence. Of course, as you move along, that becomes emails, text messages, other things like that. So you look at the correspondence on both from the participants in the lead up and in the aftermath, and usually they're descriptions are revealing. Usually their insight about what they were seeing is revealing. Newspaper coverage is a really good way to get a sense of what sort of contemporaries were talking about, how they were describing things at the moment. But then in terms of things like, you know, like let's look at some of the other things on our list. For example, when I had the March on on Selma, at the time it was clear this was a pivotal thing because people were seeing it on television and it was horrific and they were able to see the violence and the the real ferocity of the enforcement but it wasn't necessarily clear what was going to happen after so you really have to be able to step back and look at the things that come afterwards to see you know when when LBJ 
gives addresses, he references these things and therefore is, is indicating that there was an important part of his decision-making process. So if, you know, in a couple of years, there are a lot of trials, there are a lot of convictions, there are a lot of things that happen after January 6th. We start seeing politicians talking about how this was a, a turning point and we need to turn away from this sort of violence. That would indicate to us that this had a pretty important, pivotal, fundamental change on how the political system works. Uh, I don't think it's a perfect science, and I think every historian approaches these things differently, and rightfully so, which is why I think the the craft of history is so interesting, because it can be so personal. Um, but I do think it requires a certain amount of distance and the ability to sort of look at events and trace backwards to see what were what were the sparks that caused that to happen. A couple of things about that, Lindsay. One is uh, questions I have. We don't yet know how much bigger this conspiracy was than what we think it was. And almost every week now we learn it was wider, deeper, and more dangerous than we could have thought. At the time, it seemed like an unfortunate riot. Now we realize that there was actually a conspiracy of some very high-ranking people in this country, in Congress and elsewhere, to overturn the election, to engage in a coup d'etat. And I don't think we know the depth of that yet. And secondly, as you, I think, intimated, we don't know whether this is uh, the moment from which we turn back to a safer and more normal system, or whether it's a prelude to an era of violence. And I don't want to make any analogy except for this. When the Beer Hall Putsch occurred, in Munich, it could have been the very end of the career of the Nazis. It turned out just to be a prelude. So we don't know yet. You can't know. You can't know until decades have passed, probably. And so, again, I'm not making a connection between the Trump administration and Adolf Hitler or anything else. I'm just talking about how uh, an event that at the time appears to be to have failed utterly can turn out to be the prelude to a much, much larger social and historical dynamic. And so it's very important for historians to be um, open-minded and humble in the face of this, right? Um, studies of authoritarianism and um, democracies and institutions suggest, uh, if you look at sort of the wide scale of change in government, the most effective indicator of a successful coup is a failed coup attempt prior. Usually people don't give up. Um, so that is one possible option, and we won't know for a while. I so agree with what you're saying, Lindsay, and I think it's really important. You know, I, I think one of the things that people like about the Jefferson Hour and like about panels of historians when they're in the kind of playful and um, and mutually creative mode that, that you bring to it is that they see that people can disagree, that there is no history. There's no history that's set down in absolute marble and that everyone just has to figure it out, and then it's done. History is a is a is a kaleidoscopic thing that you can never really get your hands on fully. And if you put on a new lens and start to look at something, say from a womanist point of view, or from a, a Marxist point of view, or from an environmental point of view, or from a, a geopolitical point of view, the parts start to move in a different direction, and you see different patterns. And so it's never over. And every generation has to go back to the well on the revolution on the Roman Empire, on, on the collapse of the British Empire, on the assassination of John Kennedy, etc., and bring whatever they can to bear, including the perspectives that have evolved, to something that we th sort of thought we knew. I agree. And I think that some people feel that that is destabilizing to them. It feels like they can't, you know, latch on to anything and they don't have a history that it can anchor them. But I would encourage people to actually see that as an opportunity, that because we have experienced different things and new things or in a different way than the people that come before us, that gives us a new vantage point from which to try and better understand something that has happened before. So I actually really think it's quite positive and quite exciting and should be viewed as one of immense and limitless potential. But in this time of disillusionment, I know lots of conservative people who are uh, made anxious by how the ground seems to be shifting so dramatically under them on things they thought they knew. And the accumulation of all these new perspectives it has a destabilizing effect on people's confidence. And I, so I think it's, it's incumbent upon historians to bring a wider public along carefully and respectfully and patiently and not assume that the public 
can get up to speed on something you might have spent five years on, or I might have spent two and a half years on, that the, the public needs to be brought along in a really generous way, don't you think? I do. And I think that what we have to be really careful about as historians is we have to meet people where they are. And if we treat the position where they are with respect, that gives us a lot more opportunities to then bring them further or to open a door to better conversations or further conversations or deeper conversations. And so, for example, you know, when I give talks on George Washington, I get a lot of questions from people who genuinely want to know if they can like and respect him because of his slave ownership. And so it's really important, I think, for us to say you can both respect the good that someone does and not support the ill that someone does. And they don't have to balance each other out. You don't have to pick a side. And I think sometimes, frankly, people are just looking for permission to be able to have both nuanced thoughts in their head at one time. I think that people need to understand that just because you may be rethinking certain parts of, say, Jefferson, that doesn't mean that you regard Jefferson as an enemy to humankind or that he should be erased from the public record or that he is now, he can never be taken seriously again. In fact, he might be taken more seriously because he embodies some of the deepest paradoxes of American life. So thank you for that. We need to take a short break. I have more questions for Lindsay Chervinsky. Uh, and I have a couple of nominations that I want to add to our list. We'll take a brief break. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week, our part two of the 10 most important historical events, people, or places that all people should know, prompted by a question from a listener in Iowa, Bridget. And you know, I'm listening to the two of you and enjoying it immensely, as always. But if I were the professor, I would admonish the both of you and tell you that you both needed to stay after class and get this list down to 10 items. Well, tough. <laughs> I think you... Bridge is just going to have to, you know, we, I didn't I didn't want us to agree on these. And I think Lindsay will... will, will <laughs> um, I didn't want to agree on this before we recorded the program because I really wanted to hear what Lindsay... Uh, had to say in her list and how it might be the same or different from my own. I think it's richer for us not, you know, fighting it out in advance and saying, okay, we we finally, after 42 days of of debate, have agreed upon these 10. I think it's re I think it's really interesting that uh, two historians, one with an emphasis in the humanities and one with a more uh, straightforward historical emphasis, one younger, one older, one female, one male, one East Coast, and one uh, at the heart of, of the Great Plains, produced these lists, and they're both respectable. I don't think that any historian could say, well, those are ridiculous lists. But I think that the difference in them is so interesting that it makes for a much better conversation. What say you, Lindsay? I agree. I think it would be, we would be hard-pressed to narrow them down to a list. And actually, I think if we said, well, it's kind of complicated, the professor would laugh and say that is a true historian answer because historians really don't like giving straightforward answers. And we are constantly pushing to complicate the narrative and to give more answers than permitted. Well, sorry, Bridget. I did my best. You'll have to sort it out yourself, I guess. Tough it out, Bridget. I want to bring up a couple of nominations that, that were not in uh, the final list that I made. Uh, because I think they're important, and I only uh, bring them up so that I can hear Lindsay talk about them. Uh, number one, Abigail Adams, May 1776, this semi-serious, semi-playful, somewhat mysterious letter to her husband saying, I long to hear that you have declared an independency, and when you do, by the way, I urge you to remember the ladies. How pivotal is that in the history of the rights tradition, and how, what do you make of it knowing that they had a very playful, flirtatious relationship, but also a mighty serious one. They did. And the I think we've talked about the letters that come or the, the correspondence that they have that is churns out of this exchange in which they're she's she is very serious in in these points. I think it gets out a larger conception about rights and suffrage, but also about our revolution. And I have always been of the mindset that the revolution was just revolutionary enough that it created something new, but conservative enough 
that it didn't scare a lot of people. And so it does not produce a new class of elites in the United States. The same people that were sort of at the top of the social hierarchy prior to the revolution are pretty much the same people afterwards. Uh, It does not give widespread rights to Native Americans or Black Americans or women for the most part. There are a couple of tiny exceptions for a very short period of time. New Jersey for a short time. Yes, exactly. And so that means that this project, while completely world-changing and inspires constitutions and declarations and revolutions across the globe, is also really not all that different from what came before. And Abigail's letter reminds us of that and reminds us how far we have to come. And also, I think most importantly, reminds us that people at the time understood that this wasn't necessarily a fair system. So when we say, oh, well, you know, people at the time didn't understand it or we shouldn't judge them by the standards of the day or what were people thinking at that time, Abigail Adams was thinking that she would like to have some more legal rights under this system and knew that she didn't and wasn't really okay with it. I love what you're saying because in a certain sense, it's a defense of John Adams' reply. John Adams' reply said, look, one revolution at a time. I mean, that was the underlying theme of it. He was being playful and saying, rather than accept a revolution from the petticoat side, um, George Washington and I and others would fight. That's just fun. Uh, But what he's basically saying is, hold on, we're engaged in this extremely difficult thing. Uh, We'll we'll get there, but one revolution at a time. And, And I know that we can chafe at that, but you're saying that shows a really, um, discerning understanding of the dynamics of that moment. Well, it does. And, you know, I think that's often very frustrating for activists that the most successful revolutions actually take place slowly and over a period of time. So this was Theodore Roosevelt's argument about reform. If, you know, if the United States government didn't adopt moderate reform, then more radical revolution was going to happen. I think it's one of the reasons the the French Revolution failed, because it was such an extreme shift from a very absolutist monarchy to a constitutional republic. And so the most successful social change, I would argue, on sort of a global scale does happen incrementally, where there's a constant push for progress, but you don't have enormous change most of the time, that's the stuff that really sticks. And it's not to defend John Adams sometimes being a brat about this, but I do think that he understood <laughs> that if they completely changed how suffrage worked, a lot of people would have been really uncomfortable with that. So, a brat, eh? All right, here's another nomination, Lindsay. 1845, Narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. I reread it two weeks ago. And I will just say this. Every person who wants to understand the race history of this country should take the time, it can be done in an evening, to read the narrative of Frederick Douglass. It is so powerful and so chilling that somehow he was beaten, he was tortured, he was kept from learning English. Actually, at some point, he was recalcitrant as an enslaved man. And if you can imagine it, his master sent him to a slave tamer, a a breaker of slaves, a man who in Maryland, whose, whose gig, whose job, was to take recalcitrant enslaved people and break their spirit on behalf of their owners. Think of this job description and that there was somebody willing to do it. And he overcame that man, Mr. Covey. He learned English in spite of the ways that people were trying to keep him from it. And the minute he began to learn English, he said, I I can never be a slave now. The minute I learned English, I realized that I would never really again or in the long run be a slave. He escaped. He became one of the most powerful men in the history of human rights. He wrote this beautiful, straightforward narrative, which is so upsetting and at the same time so inspiring that you can hardly even begin to evaluate its importance. Uh, Lindsay, I'm sure you agree. I do. It's it's a truly remarkable document. He is a remarkable human. He was a remarkable human. He remained optimistic and hopeful despite the time he was living in, which is a a real gift, and never stopped pushing for more, but also understood when progress had been made and and was supportive and encouraging of those things, but yet wanted to continue to ask for more reform. So I think that that's an extraordinary thing. And his narrative had an impact on people because it was easy-ish 
for a lot of Northerners to turn a blind eye to what they saw as an institution that was very far removed from them. And so he, using the powerful prose that he was able to capture, and and simple prose, this was not necessarily like, you know, a Foucault situation. (laughs) He used simple, powerful... better tell him who Foucault is. (laughs) (laughs) He's a political theorist that is incredibly dense. A French 20th century political theorist who's almost unintelligibly brilliant. Yeah. So, I mean, I just, can can we just go, like, can people just be brilliant? Do they have to be unintelligibly brilliant? Anyway, (laughs) uh, Frederick Douglass um, was incredibly straightforward and, and blunt with his prose in a way that was impossible for people to turn away from. And that had an impact. It contributed to the abolitionist cause and obviously has has continued to resonate with audiences since then. And, and, you know, not everything written in the 1840s still has an appeal to people today. So it clearly stood the test of time. You know, there's one other one on your list, Clay, that I was really hoping that you would get to. And that's July 4th, 1845, when Thoreau heads to the woods. Same year. What a year 1845 was in many different respects. But these two, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, an American slave, and then Thoreau heading to the woods. This brought on Walden, one of the, I think one of the top five things ever written in America, sacred text for the environmental and conservation movement, sacred text for young people who hear a different drummer, affirmation of uh, our capacity to be critical of the urban industrial paradigm without being too radicalized by it. It's a magnificent book. I can't imagine the conservation movement that evolved with John Muir and David Brower and uh, Edward Abbey and a whole range of others without Henry David Thoreau as their foundation text. Uh, I read Walden at least once a year. Every time I read it, it speaks to me in a new way. It's a revolutionary uh, tract. And those who say that, yeah, but his laundry was being done in town um, should be banned from the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Oh, no. I think what I like so much about this moment in history is there is, I mean, yes, absolutely. His laundry was done in town. What I think that, um, I think we, what, what strikes me about this moment is as the industrial revolution was picking up and as technology was improving and, and amenities were improving, there was a sense that, you know, humans were kind of going in one direction. And yet the, Beans that we are today are really pretty similar to the beans that we were centuries and centuries and centuries ago. Our brains haven't evolved all that much. And so today, you know, like when we get really tired and we're on a Zoom call for, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, it's because our brains aren't supposed to do that. Our brains are supposed to be in the woods. And there's a reason why going into nature is restorative and helpful and meditative and all of those things. And this is the moment when people start to say, progress is good, improvement is good, but it's also okay to hold on to some of this old way of life and to appreciate these things, and there should be a balance. Now, Death of a Pine Tree um, is one of my favorite pieces of all American literature. People can Google it. Dave, do I have time for one more quick question for Lindsay? Yep, we, we do. Good. This is not on either of our lists. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. And here's why this is so interesting to me, Lindsay. I just read Thoreau's account of this. So Thoreau gave a lecture in Concord in which he defended John Brown and in a, in a very spirited uh, defense, you know, Brown was from a certain point of view, a terrorist. Uh, But Thoreau said, this is exactly what changes the world and that Brown should be taken very seriously. And he emphasizes, in spite of all the violence, what a civil and decent man Brown was during his trial. What do you make of Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry? Well, this moment is a particularly challenging one, Um, especially because you know Brown had a lot of connections with the Concord elite circle. Uh, They were very supportive in spirit and in financial funds uh, of his efforts. And for a long time, the narrative, the historical narrative, was that John Brown was terrorist. And, you know, you need to have more civilized methods with which to change society. At the same time, people also argued that the Civil War was the only thing that was going to end slavery. So I'm not totally sure how both of those things can marry in the same uh, 
narrative, but nonetheless, that's kind of, I think, what the standard story was. Can I just interrupt to say quickly, we should say that the raid occurred in the late 1850s. Uh, Brown was trying to gain the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, hoping to touch off a widespread slave rebellion in the United States. Uh, Go ahead. And to be sure, he had fairly radical ideas about the way that the rebellion should be waged. I think his argument was that all slave owners should be killed. Is that correct, if I'm remembering my history right? Um, Which is, of course, not necessarily the approach that was taken when the Civil War was actually fought or when Reconstruction was underway. So to be sure, he had a more absolutist perspective on how this should take place. And yet, I also find the argument that when you're talking about a system as evil as slavery, the only thing that can combat it is extreme violence and uh, extreme measures. I don't totally discount that argument. So, And I think that given the brutality and the ferocity of slavery, it's hard to say that the same sort of ferocity couldn't be used against it. Yeah, you know, I suspect this conversation could go on and on and on, and perhaps it will. As I said before, we're recording this uh, the week before Christmas due to uh, scheduling with the two of you. And as a matter of fact, Lindsay, you are you said that you're talking to us from a, a room at the Library of Congress. Why are you there? Well, thank you for asking. I am here as a fellow at the Kluge Center this year. The Kluge Center is the scholarly center at the Library of Congress. I have a seven-month fellowship to finish up my book on John Adams. So there's really no better place to do research as an American historian than the Library of Congress. They really have like almost everything. Uh, It's truly extraordinary. And I am very fortunate to be here. Today is the holiday gathering for fellows. So I am dressed like a Christmas package at the moment with lots of red plaid and frills and all of the above. Like to be festive. Um, And so, but I did not want to miss our time together. So I'm recording from the library. Well, bless your heart for that. Which building? Which building are you in? Would you like to guess? Oh, I hope it's the Jefferson building. (laughs) <laughs> it is. The Kluge Center is located in the Jefferson Building, which, for those of you who don't know, was the uh, once they built the library, was the original building. The Madison Building is where the Manuscripts Division is. So if you go to do a lot of research, it's in that place. The Adams Building is more of the science and technology wing. And there are fantastically confusing tunnels underneath all of the three, which I get lost on weekly. The Jefferson Building is one of the most beautiful buildings in the United States. Uh, it's it's a drop dead gorgeous building. It shows what monumental public architecture meant at a certain point in American history. Uh, I just want to say one last thing about John Brown. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt went to Osawatomie, Kansas in 1910 after his safari in Africa to give a speech about a monument being erected there, being dedicated there to John Brown. Here's what's so funny about it. Roosevelt almost never mentioned in the speech John Brown, but he did give the most radical speech by a major political figure in American history. It's the new nationalism speech in which he basically forecast what his fifth cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, would do when he came to power in the 1930s. Uh, Child welfare, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, workmen's compensation, national health care, and a range of other Um, safety controls about what he took to be a runaway capitalist economy that would lead to a a Russian-style revolution if we didn't chasten it proactively by ourselves. And so the fact that it's so Roosevelt that he wouldn't even mention John Brown. And and it's interesting in this list of 10, FDR wasn't mentioned, nor was World War II, nor World War I. Anyway, we are out of time. I thank the both of you. I did my best, Bridget, to get it to 10. Lindsay, thanks for taking the time. I mean, you're at one of the most important research institutions in the world, and yet you're in front of a microphone talking to us here at the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Happy holidays, everyone. We're not done with these lists. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. 
To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.